Okay, <laughs> welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Welcome to WeHo Reads, Creating Hope in Times of Trouble. I'm Cody Sisko, the founder and executive editor of Bookswell, which is producing this series on behalf of the city of West Hollywood. Today, I am so excited to welcome Kate Maruyama, who is going to be our guest host tonight. Kate, I think of as both a brilliant author and an outstanding literary citizen, and she has assembled a group of talented writers who, who are going to show us uh, visions for creativity, the future, and, and much, much more than I can capture in just a few remarks. So Kate, thank you so much, and take it away. Hi, uh, welcome everybody. Um, really happy to be here and very happy to see these brilliant writers once again. Uh, we had a conversation back in 2020 uh, at a very interesting time during lockdown about um, science fiction, its uh, effects on the world, um, and what we need to think about as writers, but also talking conversely about how to manage deciding what to write when the world is overrun with all all manner of turmoil. So I'm very um, happy to have all these folks back again. Uh, I a little bit about me. I am a teacher and a writer. Um, I write horror, but actually since our last meeting, I guess I can also be called a science fiction writer because I had a short story in Asimov's and one later in Analog. So that was very interesting. And I kind of wonder if it was a side effect of of all of you uh, drawing me to the dark side. Uh, actually, well, I don't know, I guess horror is the dark side. Um, and uh, I teach a class called American Horror Story at Antioch in which we look at genre fiction and its sociological um, impact and also how it manages to talk about so uh, issues going on in society in a way that um, gets the point across in a stronger way. Uh, our conversation uh, last time did talk about uh, we thinking about what we as writers put out there in the world. Um, every one of these writers has, you can go to um, Bookswell and find their full, very impressive bios, but I'm going to let them each introduce uh, themselves. They each seem to have a different angle on how they look at this topic. Um, and uh, I don't know, let's get started. So I will uh, just call in the order on my screen. Um, if uh, PJ, if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about uh, where you're coming from with this um, on this topic. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm PJ Manny, and thank you to both Cody and Kate for bringing the band back together. <laughs> uh, I'm a science fiction writer. And I originally come out of Hollywood. I was a movie executive. I was a television writer on Xena and Hercules. And I transitioned into science fiction because there were stories I wanted to tell that were not going to be able to be told on television at the time. Um, I'm here because I started a project in 2018 called The New Mythos. And in fact, Nisi, who is with us today, watched me have my out-of-body experience at NorwestCon in 2018, <laughs> um, where in a, uh, in a panel called Science Fiction in the Age of President Trump, we talked about how do we grapple with these issues of utopia, dystopia, uh, fatalism, and hope. And I had this, I started channeling something and it got a conversation going and I came home all jazzed and started a group uh, on Facebook. We're about 450 people who are writers, academics, policy wonks, artists of all kinds talking about this very subject. What are the underlying myths that our culture has depended upon over both centuries and millennia that when we go through massive paradigm shifts in technology like we are now, we start telling a whole new story and we have to re-examine all of our myths. And we've done this before over thousands of years and we're right in the middle of this right now. So how do we reassess the myths that work for us and the myths that don't? Thank you. And I look forward to talking a bit more about that. Um, Cecil Castellucci.
Um, hi, my name is Cecil Castellucci. Um, I write science fiction and I write comic books. Um, a lot of my work uh, uh, in the past has been young adult and most of it is sort of uh, uh, focused on young adults, but also adult um, science fiction. I think that when you're writing for younger people, um, one of the things that is interesting is to try to think about hopeful futures. Like how can you, how can you help um, younger generations? I don't want to say like, Oh, it's our job to help them in that way. But I think when they are given stories, it gives them tool tools for imagination. Um, and I think that's especially important when you're writing for young people, because um, you can go very, very dark uh, in young people's story, you know, in stories for um, for young people, but there always is that kind of sense of hope in it. And I think that um, when you're, uh, you know, post-apocalyptic fiction is so popular in um, in young people's literature that uh, that I think to instill hope in in some way is really important. And I also uh, am the daughter of scientists, and so I like um, talking to scientists a lot and sort of springboarding out of their um, cool things uh, in my science fiction. I'll just kind of- uh, Cecil is also an ambassador for NASA. And so I really want to talk about that as well, oh, um, how yeah. spreading the message of science is a, is a hopeful and positive thing to do. All right, uh, Cherie L. Smith, um, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Cherie L. Smith, and I also write for young people. I write cross genre, but I've done science fiction, fantasy, and I write comics, uh, mostly science fiction and com comedic comics, if you can believe that. Um, and I'm coming at this with, I agree with Cecil 100% that writing for um, young adults and younger kids uh, means writing hope. It's amazing how much hope is lacking in adult and literary adult fiction. Um, so I think that's very important. I'm also the daughter of a scientist and an educator. And my dad, who was a chemist, um, he taught me um, my love of science fiction and speculative fiction comes definitely from him. Um, and so I know that what we put on the page is going to inspire somebody who read it as a kid 40 years from now to do something amazing. So why not plant that seed? Um, I also um, have a background in something called enchantivism, which is activism for introverts using um, deep storytelling and um, mythology archetypes, um, something called terra psychology and eco psychology, which is how the landscape um, how the environment affects your mental health and how the landscape you are born into informs your psyche. And so um, the goal of enchantivism is a healthy planet with healthy people and it's interconnected. I've also done some work in fairy tale archetypal analysis. And so PJ, like I, I, I wish I was on Facebook, which I've never said in my life, um, because it sounds like you've got an amazing group over there. Perhaps you can go on and lurk. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Nisi Shaw. So, oh, I'm really bad at introducing myself. It's something that I dread every time um, because I always leave stuff out and forget things. Um, I've had a long life. I'm 68 years old. Um, I written a bunch of books. I won a bunch of awards. Um, my most recent book actually is also for younger people. Um, uh, speculation. Uh, it's about uh, these two African American girls in 1960s in Michigan who have to not just lift but redeem a family curse. So they don't just stop it, but they make it something better. And I think that that is pretty much, you know, in line with what we're talking about. Um, the other thing I'm thinking about is um, I've been talking with a script writer about a short story I wrote called uh, 2043, A Merman I Should Turn to Be, which is really harkens strongly back to uh, Jimi Hendrix. But one of the things um, that I was talking with about him is, I mean, uh, talking with him about is um, 
how the idea of uh, in, in black culture of making a way out of no way. And I think that that is really important for what we're doing here that we don't have to have, you know, genetic uh, forebears who were black, you know, you cannot like share cultures and um, we can we can all make a way out of no way. Um, and uh, Nisi is um, a huge force behind writing the other, uh, which um, yeah, has a book that's a guide for people to understand when they are not writing about themselves, what things to think about. And there are also classes involved in that. Um, that's a great link, Cody, if you can find that one to drop in the chat for folks. That's a really good resource. And I taught Nisi's uh, The Water Museum in uh, American Horror Story this year. So um, I'm, I look forward to hearing about <laughs> Anyway, I know. Uh, but anyway, oh, well, American Horror Story, actually, it covers all, all genres. Um, okay. It was just, yeah. No, it's more about how, that the US has an American Horror Story and people respond to it in different ways through. So no, I, they're not all horror stories. We teach a lot of science fiction, too. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, Matthew Kressel. Um, yeah, go Hi. for it. Hi, uh, I'm Matthew Kressel. I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer. I've written uh, a little horror, but I don't uh, write much horror these days. I've had um, uh, about 50 short stories published and two novels. Um, Nebula Award finalist three times, World Fantasy Award finalist. Uh, I co-host the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series in Manhattan with Ellen Datlow, uh, which if you are not in the New York City area, we have a podcast. Uh, just Google Fantastic Fiction at KGB. And uh, I also am the creator of the Moksha submission system. So if you've ever used that to submit a work of fiction to an online magazine, that's my creation. Uh, and you may have seen it in the news with all the AI stuff lately. Um, my uh, sort of entry into this topic was, uh, well, through many ways, but uh, in particular, um, I think I mentioned on the last uh, podcast we did, the last panel, uh, that I, I am a huge fan of the movie Blade Runner, and I've watched it like a hundred times. And it is very obviously a dystopia. And what I began to notice um, as I started doing panels on Blade Runner was like this dystopia was the default vision for the future. It's like when people thought of the future, they thought of like bleak, rainy streets, pollution, overcrowding, poverty, uh, people disenfranchised and the rich owning everything, you know, and then everyone else is living in squalor. And this became like this default vision. And I started to say, well, that's not the future that I want to live in. That's, you know, why is this the when the first thing you think of, this is uh, what, what um, you know, the first image that pops into your head. And, and it's, it, I started to realize it's just because it was just, it, it was just so saturated in, in media everywhere. And th this has changed in the past few years. I've seen a very significant change in the past few years. Um, but that was sort of my entry into it. And I was like, well, I, I want to actively work against that because even though that is a, a very fascinating future to me from a sort of storytelling standpoint, uh, I definitely don't want to live in that world. I want to live in like, you know, the the more utopian, uh, optimistic futures that I think we're all going to uh, discuss. Thank you. And um, I, I think that makes a really nice segue. Um, can uh, do any of you want to dive in on what the American obsession is with the the ugly dystopia where things don't work out and it's every man for himself? I will I will dive in on that because it's funny. I grew up with the Star Trek original series um, semi utopia that sort of taught us things can be better, but don't trust a pure utopia. Somebody's lying. <laughs> Like it was, it was a, a mixed bag, which was easier for me to swallow and, and maybe for a lot of people than, than perfection, um, which is always hiding a blemish um, or for the darkest timeline. And, um, you know, I think um, um, 
this nation is really built on the the hero's journey and maybe the western world is built on the hero's journey that it is not about a collective it's about an individual and um you know you do get collective stories in the american mythos um but it's often the collective is weak right you look at the western paradigm that it's a it's a stranger comes to town and protects the sheep from the wolf um rarely is it a you get a group of people but even when you get a group of people it's like the magnificent seven who are each lone wolves thrown together somehow so it's a pack of lone wolves instead of an actual pack and you know i think american exceptionalism has built into that you always hear about the person who came here and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps but you rarely hear about um, at least in the main, uh, the the ma majority paradigm. In the minority paradigm, I think quite often it's a family generational growth as opposed to a single person shooting to the top. Um, and so that that might have something to do with it. I think that, well, in response to Shuri, we have Henry David Thoreau really to blame. But beyond that, I'm the transcendentalist, but beyond that, <laughs> um, one of the stories that because of American individualism and the Western mythology and manifest destiny, and you put this whole package of, of and, and superiority as a virtue, quote unquote, I, big, big scare quotes, as big as you can make them. Um, we ended up creating one of the great story shifts in how we tell speculative fiction, and that's the superhero. And the issue with the superhero, when it started, it, it had a real value that it was in Superman and others, it was created to show someone who was potentially victimizable, but became the everyman, as we saw ourselves as Americans. The problem with these stories is that they imply that this, the arc of the story is not about creating a better future. It's about returning to the status quo. So whether it was Superman fighting Nazis or Batman protecting Gotham or whichever mythology you were in, it was always about returning to a status quo, never fixing the underlying issue, just getting out, going after the villain du jour and then returning society to where it was. And that kind of hero's journey, I find is neither, has no basis in reality, but also is quite destructive thinking because it implies that a we need a super powerful savior to save us we can't do it ourselves and b that the place that that superhero powerful savior is going to bring us is just back to where we started and that's in no way allows people to create a more positive vision of where we could go only where we have been do you think that this narrative, um, I mean, are there ill effects that one could see? I instantly would go to um, the hoarding of toilet paper and think of, uh, <laughs> you know, the the walking dead and all these things that are like, well, you got to protect yours because they're all coming for you sort of mentality in the stories that people have consumed. Um, uh, so um, I don't know, does, does anybody? Yeah, go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, through the decades, uh, you know, it's I, I don't think it's just sort of there was always dystopia and it was always optimistic. I think like, you know, in, in an optimistic period in the United States, you're going to see you're going to see more optimistic stories. And then, you know, uh, you know, in the in the late 80s through the 90s, you started to see like, you know, more dystopias. And then, you know, in the aughts, it was just the blood of it. And I think it's just it's just reflecting a general feeling in society. And, and I think that, um, you know, when, when people feel hopeless, they're, they're attracted to fiction that sort of reflects it back to them and reflects back, you know, um, uh, characters that are, that are, um, dealing with this and perhaps, you know, confronting it in ways that, uh, 
the reader may not be able to do themselves. It's it's kind of could be empowering that way. So I, I don't think that you know reading or writing about dystopias are necessarily bad. Um, I, I just feel like there also has to be like other imagine imaginative futures that we can you know posit as possible, right? I think um, another thing that's oh, really interesting um, is that I was just um, thinking about how male a lot of that is, you know, about um, and how I, I was thinking about the book Herland, which I know isn't an American book, but, um, you know, is this um, science, one of uh, science fiction feminist book about these three men who stumble upon a community of women that where there are no men, they've never had men, and they have a very, you know, sort of equal, you know, sort of uh, society. And, um, and they try to, you know, the men are like, but we know better, <laughs> you know, we, because we're men. And, um, and I think that that that's part of the thing, too. I mean, even when you think of, uh, you know, of, of the American West and those kinds of story, that kind of like mythos that, um, that stitched itself in. But uh, one thing, uh, you know, that I was struck by during our own pandemic, you know, and our own uh, uh, thing that happened, and we were all there, um, is the is the fact that, you know, although people were hoarding toilet paper, um, people were also sharing. That was the initial instinct of everything, right? The initial instinct of humans is to help, you know? And, um, and I think that because uh, we tell stories and 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 we like to um, think about worst case scenarios that we always go to that sort of Blade Runner thing. But I think the fundamental truth is that when, you know, when when bad things happen, you know, most of the time people are, you know, helping. And um, and I think that that I don't know if it's that that weird thing where, you know, nice stories are boring. <laughs> and so we have to go to like the deep you know, the deep troublesome things. But, um, but I think that's part of our challenge is to make the, to make the, the, the bringing of starter over to a friend's house as like the, you know, as, as, as a, as a very interesting thing and as a compelling thing, um, uh, you know. Uh, Nisi? Yeah, I think I'm here just to contradict everybody. Um, uh, Cecil, were you saying that Herland was not a, an American book? I I can't remember what the I I wasn't sure if she was American or if she was British, so that's why I said I wasn't sure if it was an American book. Yeah, it is. It is. She she oh, was okay. an American feminist, uh, okay. Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Okay, um, thank you. I couldn't remember, and so that's why I was like, I I didn't want to be like it's an American book and then have it be you know British or something. And the other thing that is, um, I have seen pretty much the opposite of what you're talking about, Matt, which is that when we have um, more dystopic conditions, then people are escaping into utopias, literary utopias, and vice versa. So that's what I'm seeing. I mean, I'm just, you know, uh, another person, a, a writer. I'm not like a scholar or anything, but that's that's the inclination that I see. Um, and as far as what harm it does, um, I think it it uh, limits the stories that that, that get told. Um, and I'm not saying that as like you know denigrating anybody because I just today finished writing a story about how um, there was this flock sentience. And um, it was, uh, I was trying to draw a parallel between uh, algorithms and true AI and the uh, members of this flock and their actual sentience. And I realized like 18 days into the story that I had written it from the point of view of one person discovering this truth. And it was like, no, wait, no, the whole family has to discover this. Otherwise, I'm like, not embodying the theme so so it I hurts think, yeah i think individuality becomes our default just because of what we're saturated with we are going to come back to this um but at present we do have a city council member from 
uh, WeHo Arts, uh, which is West, the city of West Hollywood, who is, uh, has created this fine event. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Cody. Thank you. I'm so grateful for this space where everyone can come together and sort of sketch out these tensions that run through both our society and, and the stories that we tell. Um, and that's made possible because of the WeHo Reads program, which is um, a West Hollywood city event. And um, uh, well, I'll ask Mike Che, who is the um, arts division person who makes this all possible, um, because I think uh, he's going to read a land acknowledgement for us and then ask the city council member to say a few words. Yeah, uh, thank you, Cody. And thank you to all our readers and everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, it is actually because of all of you that we have WeHo Reads. So we're very thankful for that. Um, as Cody mentioned, uh, my name is Mike Che. I'm the arts coordinator for the city of West Hollywood. I have the pleasure of overseeing uh, quite a few of our arts programs. Um, we do want to uh, acknowledge that the land that the city of West Hollywood is on is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrieleno Tongva and Gabrieleno Keech peoples. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional caretakers of Tovangar and we pay respect to their elders, past and present. Um, I do encourage all of you to acknowledge um, the native uh, peoples and caretakers of your lands. Um, you can look at native-land.ca to find uh, who have been the traditional caretakers of your lands. Um, speaking of being in West Hollywood, we do have two in-person events for those of you who happen to be in Los Angeles County. Um, I'm just going to do a quick shout out. This Sunday, October 22nd at 5 p.m., we are welcoming our brand new city poet laureate, Jen Cheng. So we'll be having an event at 5 p.m. in Plummer Park in West Hollywood. That's free to attend. And then uh, in just a couple, a few weeks, uh, we have on Wednesday, November 8th, um, a very special WeHo Reads collaboration with Literary Deathmatch. That's a um, comedic literary reading battle with judges. Um, we've got Rashid Newsom and um, uh, uh, a whole great, um, a great lineup. You can find all, all that information at weho.org slash arts. Um, in addition to Cody's wonderful help, all of your authors and all of you attending, the City Council of West Hollywood is really the ones who put the money behind the words and they say they are very supportive of the arts and we are very um, lucky to have our Mayor Pro Tem, John Erickson here, who would like to just welcome everybody and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, John. Is John I, awesome? I, Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. John, John, it looks like your mute is on. You know? Now we can hear you. You're we good. need technology and, and troubling times. That That's where I'm at at the moment. Um, hello, everyone. It's My name is John Erickson. I'm the vice mayor of the city of West Hollywood. I am actually at another city event, so I'm in the back because this is our lives as city council members, but I've been the Disability Service Awards event for our, our DAB. Um, just wanted to thank each and every one of the panelists tonight, as well as Cody and Mike for all the work that they do. I've been thinking about what to say tonight, finding hope in troubling times. I I struggle to do someone's call in all, all of those ways of you bring out themes that give me hope is helping me discover how that can go into the public realm. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We can never not have enough joy and hope in this world. I appreciate all that you are and all that you do. And I'll turn it back over to you. Obviously we have a few um, science fiction gremlins uh, messing up with the uh, audio. But uh, we really do appreciate our entire city council and um, Mayor Pro Tem John Erickson for supporting, uh, continuing to support WeHo Reads. And uh, enough from the city. We should turn it back over to the wonderful authors. Thank you. All yours, Kate, and all of our magnificent panelists. 
Thank you. And thanks, Mike. Um, the We Have Reads has said some just fabulous series every weekend. It seems like there are a new collection of writers talking about something different or sharing their work. So I appreciate it. Um, all right, we were going back to the um, the idea of dystopia, and obviously it's, I think, cathartic for some people, but it is interesting how our um, default uh, tends to be that sort of individualism. Um, I wondered, uh, Sheree, you had talked about the masculine and feminine and as a larger narrative in sort of society. I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. A few of us have tapped into that and um, I should have my notes in front of me and I don't. So I'm going to do a bad job of this, but I'm going to talk about um, there's a chart. Um, uh, I get this from Dara Marks, who has her PhD in, myth in mythological studies from Pacifica Institute here in Southern California. And um, she uses this in storytelling, but it is the concept of uh, think of a circle and then cut it into quarters. And the upper half represents the masculine and the lower half is the feminine. So the underworld and the upper world. And um, one side is the immature or the young and the other side is the mature. And so every story can go through this cycle, but every person and every culture goes through this cycle from the insecure, immature, right. feminine, um, through to the, the the American story loves to live in the immature masculine, which is the young hero who's going to go out and fight dragons and, and win the kingdom. And then we tip into where we actually are now, which is the descent. It's, a, it's the mature masculine who maybe he has, uh, the hero has achieved everything and slain the dragon and it feels empty. Or Maybe they did all the right things. How many of us have this in our careers? You did all the right things and you still didn't get the pilot. So, you know, you're still, um, it didn't, didn't give you the reward it was supposed to. And our society seems to be in this sort of area of disappointment right now. And it's, and it is what this is connects the masculine to the immature feminine because they both have a, come from a place of insecurity. And the, the solution is, a descent into the underworld to the mature feminine, which is a place of acceptance and appreciation rather than demanding that we are rewarded in our American dream with like the big house and the, and the car and the, you know, arm candy and everything else, the just seeing what we have done and recognizing that like the wheel is turning. And so this, I remember listening to Dara speak a few, uh, several years ago now, like pre-Trump, like it must have been in the, uh, like the early teens and how um, she said, oh, I think this is where we are right now. And who knows how long these cycles last, but we are definitely still there, still churning. And um, every war, everything you see on TV today in the news, every loss that we're experiencing are the death throes of disappointment. And we need to, um, we need to heal ourselves. And books can do that. I should add that. And books can do that because it's people like us who will say these things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I can, if I can add uh, really quickly, I, I was on a retreat at Hedgebrook, a writing residency with a young woman from um, uh, Zimbabwe. And I was talking to her about the paradigm of the, the starving artist and how I hated it because the archetype is the artist, not the starving artist. And she said, I don't have, I, I wish I had it in front of me, but she said a friend had told her that the word um, in their language for um, uh, like the poet. It was basically somebody who was a, um, like, you know, the court jester was actually like a wise person who gave counsel to the king, but they changed the word and they removed the part that was wise and just made it like the joker. And how um, the power of writers is when we have the ear of those in power. And when we lose that, which is why I think that the book banners in the world are fighting so hard to remove our power right now, because God forbid it gets into the ear of the leaders and the world changes for the better. 
or informs future leaders, future thinkers. That's, that's exactly right. Um, you know, just before we came on, I was going through social media and how come I can't pull it up now? Give me one second. And I came across an Instagram of a, someone who I'd never followed. Um, and his name is Joseph Awuha Darko. And he is an artist and social entrepreneur and philanthropist um, in Ghana. And he wrote this, and I think it's perfect for what we're talking about. He wrote, dear artists, no one is listening to politicians. No one is listening to scientists. So suddenly the arts bear this huge responsibility to reflect what is happening in the world. And I think that's what we've always done, but now more than ever, it's important because people aren't listening to what used to be called authority. And we're among the only voices they're still listening to. Yeah, it's like they're not trusting it, right? Like they're, they're, they're it's not just that they're not listening to, um, to them, they're not trusting. And sometimes with good reason, sometimes for ill reason, you know? Um, yeah, and I, I think I think and say, which is why it's interesting that suddenly we're on strike and not allowed to work if we are television or film writers um, or actors. You know, like the voices are being shut down. Yeah, mm. I, I really resonated with, with what you said, Cherie, uh, just in terms of like the disappointment and disillusionment, because I think like I've I've seen that a lot. Um, you know, uh, I think we're all aware like the, the tr traditional social structures uh, that maybe our parents or our grandparents relied on just aren't there. Um, you know, in particular, like uh, a lot of people are moving away from religion, right? And, and organized religion and a lot of people, like the, the social safety net isn't so strong. Like uh, the cost of living is, is so, so much higher now. Um, you know, all these things, you know, are, are making life harder for people and you know that we've like society itself is saying well why why can't you do all these things all these things and then you're constantly running up against this disappointment and i and i think it's like it's happening on a much much larger scale and i think that yeah i mean um i i wouldn't go so far as to say that no one is listening to scientists and no one is listening to politicians. But I do think that um, certainly there has been a, a, a large anti-science movement more so in the past few years. Um, but, but on the other hand, like, you know, cause I, this is supposed to be like a hope panel, right. Is like, I, I do see like, a, you know, and maybe it's just that it's the particular um, my interest, but I see like a, a whole lot of science YouTube channels that have popped up in the last few years, like really, really good ones too. And not just like, you know, superficial stuff, you know, pop science, but just like really detailed stuff. There's this one guy, Anton Petrov, uh, who does a, a daily, uh, science, uh, YouTube thing. And it's just like, he, he like, you know, finds a really interesting paper and talks about it for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff like that on the internet and it's just like, I, I feel like it's just, maybe it's not reaching enough people. I, I think that's an excellent point, Matthew, because what, well, what we've seen, you know, social media, the internet, there's so many voices and we hear a lot of these voices of negativity, but there's so many more voices of hope. It's it's uh, it is a frighteningly democratic process uh, to throw yourself into you know into the public sphere like that, and I think that what we as people don't recognize is how much power we actually have. And I'm not just talking about us as writers or as artists in general. I'm talking about everybody. We all have so much power, but we've been told with these individualistic stories of, you know, a Sloan savior hero who will come and, and take care of it for us that that we need to just sort of, you know, everything will be we can wait. We have the luxury of sitting back and we don't. 
um, we all have to get into this together. And when you really break down society, you see that really it's only about 30% of society or the people who we would go, Ooh, you're scary. Like that's, that's authoritarianism. That's fascism. That's, you know, theocracy, that's the stuff where you go, mm, no, but they're very loud. And we have to learn how to be as loud, if not louder. I I thought, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that's why, like, I mean, I felt very hopeful in terms of storytelling in the future, being on the strike lines, you know, and, and sort of fighting uh, for telling that story, uh, you know, telling stories and, you know, and fighting against uh, the idea of um, this sort of um, mono story, mono culture that like, uh, you know, uh, the the fears of AI and all of that uh, coming in and, and sort of keeping stories human um, to be able to tell those smaller stories that give us um, that give us hope and, and help. And, uh, you know, the other thing is maybe I'll just take a moment to mention um, the hopeful thing that I see with like, uh, you know, I, so I've been doing this uh, solar system ambassador thing um, with NASA, where, you know, it's sort of a citizen volunteer who goes around and talks about, uh, you know, our solar system and the space program and how, how, you know, you know, those explorations of our home space uh, is a very um, helpful and hopeful to how we can help our planet um, down the line with all of the, the science and the, and the space science that we're doing. And I find that to be really inspiring in terms of um, springboards for stories, especially with working with kids. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to counter the the kind of negativity and and like horrible things going on in the world with 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 beautiful things and with optimistic things and you know things of hope and and I think it's like for me I I know that when there's situations going on in in my life and in the world like like they are now I I, I find you know those types of things really grounding like like oh my God, you know, this situation in the Middle East right now has me really on edge. And then I'm like, oh, but I can listen to a, a, a science podcast and and like someone's talking about, you know, some of the discoveries that JWST made this month, you know, they found these, you know, free floating planets, like, you know, not around any star and they were, they were binary planets. And I'm like, that is the coolest thing I think I've ever seen this year. So it's like that type of stuff just like, you know, it's, it's, it's a little cliche, but like Mr. Rogers once said, he's like, when there's a catastrophe, look for the helpers. Right. And, and it's kind of like that. It's like when things are bad in the world, you look towards the people that are like doing better things. Well, and Nisi, you had talked about us escaping into things when the dystopia is happening. Do you, do you feel like that, that it'll come that way now, further away from dystopic stories? Yeah, I do feel that, that way, um, and especially, I think, for anyone who is marginalized, which is, you know, come on, face it, most of us here, right? Um, we, when we are experiencing dystopia, which actually is something that is pretty widespread and has been going on for longer for some people than for others, um, we need those visions of a utopia. Um, and and uh, so I think that's why we turn to this wild stuff, you know, all of, all of these fantasies, all of these science fictional things. Now, um, horror, how does horror relate to that? Because um, there is a strong resurgence of horror lately, and yet I do not see it as... Um, dystopic because it's not usually pointing at the future mm -hmm. it's pointing at the past so uh the person who has helped me to understand this the best was john jennings um because he talks about the ethnogothic um that is the term that he invented and what he's talking about is people 
discussing and, and getting into and vibing with and um, putting out there and displaying the baggage that keeps them from moving into what he calls the Afro future, but what it could be any, any, um, any future that is, that is positive. It's, um, if you explore this, then you um, can cleanse yourself of it, I guess, and get rid of it and then move on to the future. So I don't think of horror as dystopic at all. It's very rarely about the future, which um, it's just preparing us to hope, I guess. It's kind of a catharsis is what you're saying? Yes, yes. Um, a catharsis and an acknowledgement um, because then you would not have to cart it with you into the future. Mm -hmm. That's that's his idea, and I and it it resonates for me. I don't know how did I get on to that. Wait, you <laughs> no, I, I think that's totally great. I, I love somebody talking about horror. I have a question because you know it's like you know when we're talking about dystopia and utopia, it's it's like I I I still feel that thing that like Cherie was saying where there's kind of like a distrust of utopia, right? Like that utopia is like this sort of sin that there's a sinister underlying. So I'm almost wondering if like we need a new word for those. I, hope I have stories. heard of heterotopias. Yeah, that, I was just about to bring that up. Yeah, it, so, so. Begin. <laughs> Michelle Foucault <laughs> in the late 60s uh, explored this idea of what he called heterotopias. And the most important thing to understand about a heterotopia is it's the thing in between. It's not the revelation of a dystopia and it's not a utopia. Heterotopias are by their definition, things that are separate. So it can be a liminal space. It can be, you know, hospitals and cemeteries and schools after hours and these places that, that, that create discomfort. They can be uh, uh, vehicles, spaceships, uh, ocean ships places that basically separate you. But more importantly, the create people trying to create a utopia is itself heterotopic. So they're not actually a utopia. They are a separate space in which we're striving to make a better place. And so he emphasized that this notion of heterotopia was crucial in the 60s. I mean, he wrote this in 1968. So we're, you know, talk about history rhyming. Um, we're in one of these upheaval periods, again, which happen in our American history every 40 to 60 years, like a drumbeat. And we happen to have, this drumbeat happens to be much louder than most, because not only are we in the 50, quote unquote, year cycle of, of, uh, political unrest, but we're also in the 100 year pandemic cycle and the 250 year uh, to 300 year uh, empire fall apart cycle. So mm. all those cycles met at the same time. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, but yeah, so this idea of heterotopia is, is super important to realize that everything we're actually talking about writing about hopeful futures is heterotopic, not utopic. Yeah, I think I think you know terms are slippery, right? Because everybody has different definitions, and uh, you know, as we said, one person's utopia might be another person's dystopia. And you know, I, I always like to say that you know, utopia is not a noun; it's a verb. It, it's something that you work towards. It's not something that just is. It's not just something that's static. Um, but I think that you know, there can definitely be like certain metrics that you can say this is, you know objectively better we can say that you know there are fewer people on this planet starving to death now than there were 50 years ago that's objectively better there are fewer child you know child uh you know mothers dying in childbirth there you know the, um you know things like that and you know the health care you know yes we have a long way to go in a lot of things but um you know and, and i think it's like that kind of arc that kind of progress is is you know at least in my fiction is what I try to like focus on. Cause it's like, you, you know, you're, you're never going to create a, a perfect world, right? We're all imperfect beings and, and the world is just chaotic. You can't control it, but you, you can have a world that is objectively better than where we are now. Sheree, you were going to. Well, I was going to say just to, um, 
um, I appreciate what you're saying, Matthew. And I feel like, you know, like utopia is a vanishing point. You know, you can always head towards it. You'll never reach it. But that's fine because it keeps you busy. If you, God forbid you get there, who knows what we would do then. But this idea, um, PJ, that you just said about, um, um, you know, the the different cycles um, all sort of lining up like a perfect storm in a way. In Enchantivism, uh, which was created by this guy, Dr. Craig Chalquist, his, it, it, there's a concept of trans revolution because we have revolutions all the time. And as he describes it, all a revolution does is put the people who are being crushed by the wheel on the top of the wheel, crushing the people who used to be on top. And so trans revolution is a uh, concept of actual transformation so that we can evolve and revolve, but transform and not just continue in the same cycle. What's interesting is we see it happen somewhat in technology, right? We take these crazy leaps in technology that really change everything forever and there's no going back yeah, and, until we run out of fossil fuels and we can't power the engines anymore, I guess. But there's no, um, what is that on the human cultural level? Um, you know, how do we really break out of it? And, and I don't know, but but uh, this other concept of enchantivism is what we're doing right now. We are a thought school and a thought school is a group of like minded people coming together to puzzle it out and wrestle with the hard questions. And we might come up with a couple of answers and we might not come up with anything, but what but we can then put that hard work into our writing and teach other people how to do that hard work. And maybe we will reach a critical mass at some point where we can actually have a, a human breakthrough. So Marie, let's I love bring you. In oh go ahead cc sorry i was just saying i love you that was that was what i needed to hear so that is the the question here as we move forward um what can we as writers do um and uh Jury, i think you can segue us there through enchantivism what is the idea of storytelling in enchantivism what part does it play that oh, okay so so deep storytelling um so right now you guys are familiar with storytelling as propaganda right where you know a politician says why i was in iowa and i met a mother of three who said how can you help me pay for my child care or whatever and it's false like we all sort of go oh whenever you hear one of those stories because even if they find a person to play that person it feels fake deep storytelling um take seed in the idea that you can give facts and figures to people um, and it's water off a duck's back. But if they say to you, tell me a story, what they're saying is I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to have my mind changed. So you get to know your audience, you get to know the myths and stories of their culture, um, whether that's an ethnic identity or a, uh, a nation state identity or a fandom or whatever it is, learn their story language and you can start to tell stories that they can hear and absorb in their DNA. And, um, and another thing that you do is in enchantivism is you take a world problem and you elevate it to, uh, you put it in the story sphere, you put it into the imaginal world um, by finding parallels. Like I've been struggling at when uh, Russia invaded U Ukraine. Um, I did a post on Instagram about um, the story of, um, oh my gosh, I'm spacing on 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 um, um, my character. Oh, Kolshai the Deathless, um, a Russian folk tale um in which there is this undying man held who has a very clever horse and he kidnaps a, a a woman who's married to this prince who then has to go and try to rescue her but but um Kolshai, i'm doing a bad job of this but go to my instagram and you'll see but the idea is there's a parallel there and what it led me to was the question of Kolshai got his weapons from his horse from the baba yaga who is the Baba Yaga in the Russia-Ukraine paradigm? And I'm going to leave that for the politicians or for you to figure out on your own. But I've been puzzling it out with um, Israel and Gaza and Hamas right now. And the story that I'm coming up with is the sort of infamous King Solomon's wisdom story of two women saying that this is my child um, and him saying, well, cut it in half 
and you can each have half of the kid and the one woman saying no no don't kill the baby and so he goes you get to have the kid because clearly you love it enough but we're in this world now where we've already cut the baby in half we've already cut the baby in half so where do you go from there so that is like i would sit in a room with other storytellers or or story listeners and puzzle it out like what does this lead us to so that's that and so that is something that you can then put into the stories you're working on it's like I medicine. know what happens in that story. See? Oh, you see. Yeah. Um, it's not great, is it? Um, uh, not for the mothers. <laughs> no. Well, you know what's interesting about that story that I didn't know? I went back to read it and I was like, oh, it's described as two whores were roommates. And they both got pregnant and they each had a baby and one's baby died. And so in the middle of the night, she swapped babies with the other living baby. And then that woman woke up and said, no, that's my baby. And they end up in front of Solomon, which is crazy. And I love that, like, oh, yeah, and they were both prostitutes, by the way, which you think about that on a global scale, like uh, on a nation scale. What are we saying there? And what if we could stop the story beforehand? Because otherwise you have a collective of women who could raise their children together. Maybe that's where we need to be going politically um in the you know shifting uh narratives and talking about narratives um cecil t called me and said do you want to go to a science salon and i did not know what that was and i said yes um but i think that uh that what we attended plays into this idea of um uh trying to um imagine and write a future that people can believe in um, and so Cecil, I didn't know if you could talk about that a bit. Sure. So um, there's this great organization that I love and I'm slightly obsessed with uh, called the um, Science Entertainment Exchange. And um, uh, a lot of people in Hollywood use it, um, but it's an exchange through the National Academy of Sciences that puts together uh, Hollywood writers and other writers, I suppose I've used them um, uh, for uh, with scientists. So if you are doing a science fiction story and I need uh, for Shifting Earth, my last um, graphic novel, which is, you know, kind of a whole punk book about a botanist who's trying to rewild uh, on in a near future Earth. Um, they hooked me up with a botanist who's doing rewild work and um, and reclaiming sort of like seeds that, you know, wild uh, seeds and um, trying to make things resilient and robust and which I find to be very hopeful, you know, that there are people out there that are doing that. So uh, Kate and I went to one which was about the climate crisis and it was with an uh, oceanographer uh, uh, scientist Um who, you know, sort of very clearly laid out the big problems that are and then the acceleration of certain things that are happening, but also, uh, you know, with very clear science, instilled a lot of hope and talked to us about how we can uh, tell these hopeful stories because, you know, especially with the climate crisis and I think with every crisis, uh, you know, there's there's a way to be hopeless about things, but um, you know what can we do? What can we do? The best day to start doing something positive and actionable is today, right? Like, uh, you know, so um, so that is something that I think is a really uh, great resource. I think for uh, for writers, um, they do a lot of online uh, uh, Zoom Zoom lectures and stuff like that, and they talk to all kinds of scientists, and I think it's really important in that sort of what you were talking about, Sheree, that sort of like thought exchange um, to get inspired. And also, Matt, like what you were saying about just being inspired and feeling hopeful about like the fact that there's like two binary planets, like just, you know, wandering around out there without a sun, like that seems very hopeful to me, you know, in some way. Um, and the it was Dr. Joellen Russell, who is part of Science Moms. Um, and it's a uh, a bunch of scientists who've gotten together to um, create a more hopeful narrative around climate change because there is this, well, we can't do anything about China, so we might as well give up. And what she she pleaded to the people present who were a lot of screenwriters and producers um, saying that 
instead of telling those dystopian end of the world stories where everything falls to pieces, what about showing genuine global warming, but showing people grouping instead of fighting it like individually, grouping together and solving problems and maybe having small gettable goals. Uh, the hope she instilled this in us um, was that, uh, you know, the US has brought down its carbon footprint by 20% in the past six years simply by making small changes. That was like staggering to me. Uh, and she said that people's individual choices have had more of an impact. Uh, people just doing things, you know, driving different kinds of cars, using solar power, have had a much vaster impact than we had thought. And so her idea was that, um, yeah, if we if we show characters working together, uh, solving problems, small problems, not creating a utopia, um, but sort of, you know, in that heterotopia space, uh, creating stuff that we could actually make an effect. Go ahead, Cherie. Well, and to also, I'm sorry, just to, uh, to also, I think the point that she was saying was that if we tell these stories about things actually making a difference, even if they're small, because I think there's a lot of the stories, you know, a lot of the, the fiction, you know, out there is that like, well, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway. Nothing. I So I'll just throw this piece of litter. I mean, I don't, you know, uh, and that's not true. It does matter. I just wanted to say that, so I teach in a, um, uh, an MFA uh, creative writing program for children. And what I've noticed coming out of the critical work of the students lately um, are more papers about the collective protagonist, whether it's a family or a community, and that these are young writers who are now looking to change. Um, there's a lot of talk about moving away from the hero's journey. And so it will be interesting to see as the writers live in a world that is facing problems, the solutions they come up with that they feed into the stories that will feed our young people. And it's not just feeding our young people in terms of giving them hope, it's feeding them to become the things that we see hope in. So with Cecil's uh, exposure, if somebody decides I actually want to be a climate scientist or I want to go and be the thing that I just read about, it's a hell of a lot more likely than, you know, the 18 volcanoes destroy the West Coast movies. I didn't see a lot of volcanologists come out of that. Um, you know, this is this is what we're looking for is we're looking for people to encourage people in the in, the, you know, all the generations to do something hopeful, but especially young people to choose to make a life about creating hopeful scenarios. So and even just the idea that there are hopeful scenarios can lead to others devising their own. They don't, it's not even that they have to follow the patterns that are presented to them. They just know that there's something better can happen. There can be more. Well, we even see it in technological feedback loops in storytelling and technology, right? You know, here we are science fiction writers and we're writing things that get made. <laughs> and, you know, and some of those, I mean, I can raise a hand and say, beware the cautionary tale filled with ethics that then gets read by the tech bros and turns into the torrent nexus meme and you're living the torrent nexus meme that's what i'm living through right now but <laughs> having said that um you know if there are ways of creating things instead of the cautionary tale the it, wouldn't it be fantastic to have a tricorder these are the things where it can it, it can actually be as as small as that like the thing we present and someone goes wait a second i could make that so, uh, so lightbringer society has a writing contest every year um and i think it's the audubon society sponsors the green feather award i think it's called and it's these are stories written by teens and that the winner of that is something that shows a positive ecological future and just, I've been a judge for that a few times and it's it's always inspiring. Um, and also the upper uptick in STEM programs and uh, the push to get more um, uh, girl students into STEM has, has had huge effects. Um, and this might be one of the best countries to be a scientist now. Um, that's another thing Dr. Russell said uh, it, for, for women. 
Um, but Cecil, I wondered if you could talk about, um, you know, a lot of NASA scientists and they have all talked about how they were influenced by what they were viewing and consuming in science fiction growing up. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what I'll, I, I'll talk about is that there was a, a scientist um, who's uh, who's on Osiris Rex and and who's also on uh, the um, yeah uh, the you know she's looking at the rocks right now that just came back and uh, but she's also an art maker um, and makes art based on uh, data from uh, you know from space science and stuff and she did this really cool workshop. Um, where she it was uh, uh centered around the Europa Clipper um uh mission that's going to be happening and they had like the astrobiologists and mission lead and the you know space scientists like all talking about it at this like sort of four three-day workshop uh to make art inspired by actual space science and I think that that that's the thing too right is that a lot of that's just exactly what everyone was just saying it's like a lot of scientists like actual scientists who are doing all these amazing things that inspire us are are also making art you know and it's so like there's no difference between art and science we all go to the lab and we we try we experiment with things and we some things blow up in our face and some things, you know, blow up beautifully. And, um, and we keep going with that. And I think that that's something that helps us to push forward these new stories is to, um, is to, is to have that sort of, uh, you know, uh, symbiotic relationship, that synchronicity between art and science. Well, I want to, I want to jump off there because, uh, what, what you said, Cecil, and, and then also Kate, and then um, I, I think uh, PJ, you, you, you uh, have posted a lot about this. People say STEM, and we always, I always try to correct them, and I think you do too. We say STEAM, right? Because you want to include arts in there, right? Because and then the arts would include the humanities as well. Because you know, um, when I went to uh, college, I, I majored in computer science, and it was very, very heavy technical stuff and then we had like a few classes in in humanities and then it was like one ethics class right so it was like really there I, I feel as if you know the humanities the arts really teaches you what it is to be human and, and then like we also know from uh, a lot of studies that that reading fiction actually improves empathy you know it puts you in the in the in the mind of another human being and can experience life as someone else and that improves empathy and it's like you know the more people read and understand others the more compassionate and humane we're going to be in general and I, and I think that like so what you know I I feel like it's always like stem 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 and I'm like well you need to have the arts in there you need you can't just push out you know the humanities you need you need to have that and like so so like you said Cecil it's it's hand in hand that they're, they're they're like the same thing that you can't separate it out because then you, then you have just you know then you have war drones right and that like people just yeah let's just build war drones and like kill a million people and not and then it's like well who cares you know it's cool or then you have like the AI people that are just like oh we don't care that we're stealing from millions of people in order to make this this machine that can can you know generate text we don't care who cares that's because they they never developed that empathy you know and it's not just empathy they never developed an understanding of what humans are or how they work mm. and we are storytelling creatures even those who don't study the humanities or the arts fall back on their whether it's great or meager ability to tell a story to present themselves and their beliefs and their work in the world and what we all know having studied it and having beyond studied we we are immersed in it is just how crucial it is to understand each other to understand our world, our reality. If you don't understand reality, and reality is multifaceted and there's not one single model, and the idea that that anybody can contain all of reality is nonsense. The point is we all have a reality that we need to share. 
And those realities together can make something we can work with, but just one person's vision is not enough. So what, um, in, in your writing, like what responsibility do you think lies with the writer to show, you know, diversity in groups of like skills? Cause I, at PJ, that just made me think of, you know, you don't just need the person who's good at science. You don't, you need, um, people with different skills working together. Um, do you feel that the writer has some responsibility for what they're putting out there? Or what advice would you give to writers um, as they're trying to write through stuff? Yeah, Nisi. So I, uh, one of the formative experiences in my life was going to uh, the, one of many Black to the Future conferences. This one was, I believe at Harvard. Um, there were a bunch of Black artists, there were a bunch of Black Lives Matter activists, and um, the writers, uh, including like Stephen Barnes and Nalo Hopkinson, all these, all these science fiction authors and fantasy authors, put together a credo. And one of the first things they said is, we uh, want to write whatever the fuck we want. <laughs> Uh, I mean, nobody can can make you responsible for what you have to write. You know that that is the way of propaganda. But at the same time, I feel like um, what we really want to do as writers is change the world. When I was little, people used to ask me what I wanted to be, and I would say, "Oh, a magician." <laughs> Right? Like not on the stage pulling rabbits out of hats. I wanted to be an actual magician. Why not? Um, and this is as close as I've ever come being a, a, an author. So yeah, um, we, I don't think, I don't think it's anything that can be imposed upon us, but I think that we naturally do um, feel not necessarily a responsibility, but an urge to um, write a world that is welcoming and diverse and that makes us um, makes us magicians. You know, Alan Moore actually speaks about that. Like he, you know, he, the comic book artist that he's, you know, he is an actual practicing magician and, uh, um, you know, uh, CK, not C, right? And uh, so he 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 talks about you know that writing is a form of magic, right? Because you're you're inserting, you're literally putting images in someone else's mind, which is a form of magic. Yeah. AJ, please. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh... I, the change in what happened with our country absolutely changed how I responded as a writer and changed everything for me. Um, I think that it changed the direction of my trilogy. I literally threw out the last book of my trilogy, because I realized that I could not write that book once Trump had been elected. First of all, my prognostication was off because I thought we had at least four more years before this was going to happen. You know, the American studies is my was my background. And um, so I had a very good understanding of, again, that drumbeat of, of American history. And but it also changed what I thought my responsibilities were. I think that I agree with Nisi where we have to write whatever the hell we want to write. Like we have to, we have to speak from our hearts. We have to, we have to magically transmute that alchemy of writing, whatever our feelings and our experiences are into something that we can entertain with. But I also felt my responsibilities changed radically. And I wrote a very different book 
in fact, my series, my trilogy goes from the old mythos to the new mythos. And you see this transformation of not just the characters, but the actual story structure, how, how everything works into a new mythos story. And once you start opening yourself up to learning new story structures, learning new perspectives, learning new ways of looking at the world, you can't go back. And that becomes your new responsibility. Shereen? I was going to say that um, a few years ago when the Me Too movement hit children's literature, um, I ran a, uh, a World Cafe conversation, World Cafe style conversation um, in my MFA for children's literature program. And um, basically you get groups of people sitting around uh, small tables, like groups of six to eight people, um, and you throw out a question and they wrestle with it and they draw and write their answers. And then everybody switches to a different table, except for one host who sort of the new group um, comes from all over and they, they uh, share what they've talked about, and then you throw out another question. Um, and then at the end, we put all of our answers up on the wall, like a museum to see what we had come up with. But um, uh, the first question I asked was, how can children's writers save the world? And it was fascinating to me. So, like half the group was like, oh, here's what we can do, you know, we can teach empathy, we can do this, we can educate, we can blah, 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 blah. And the other half was like, why is that our job? Not my responsibility at all. And my, I mean, my first instinct, actually, I would say they were less than half, it was probably about a quarter of the people. And I actually kind of wanted to say, like, then please leave. Like, if you don't want to do the magic thing, then, then, you know, why get a Pegasus if, if you're not going to fly, you know, but at the same time, I respect that. You have to respect that, that like, yeah, that is when you think about it that way, it is a big responsibility. But, but, you know, um, I also think that they shouldn't underestimate what they can contribute. You know, and if it scares you, that's probably better than if it doesn't. You know, when it doesn't scare you, and you think you're the one with all the answers, we're, we're generally in, in trouble. Um, so uh, I, I do think that writers can um, and, and to what you were saying, PJ, with the um, learning different story structures, that's something that I've been seeing. I used to also teach in an adult fiction MFA program, and I've been, I've been using different storytelling structures, and I'm watching the students now pull all these different structures from all these different cultures, and it is very exciting to see. What'll be interesting to see is I've found I've had to tweak it for a Western audience. You know, if I'm doing a, I was using a Japanese story structure, Kisho Tenketsu, I need to tweak it to make it understandable. But that's fine too, right? Like as we come up with these hybrids, maybe we come up with the third path. Yeah, I, th I think for for me, I I. Um along the lines of what Nisi said that I, I would never tell a writer that you have to do X, right? Cause like people are drawn to the creative arts for all sorts of reasons. And, you know, everyone's got, you know, different things that they want to express. And some people may not want to express hope or optimism. You know, they, they might have something else to say and I would, I would never speak for them or, or, you know, restrict what they or should or shouldn't say, you know, I can only write what compels me. And and I think like the other panelists have said, it was like, I think I, I sensed a, uh, I certainly felt it before 2016, but, but definitely after I, I felt this need to just create different stories. Um, and some of them hopefully will be out soon. I, I've, I've, finished a few long ones recently and very very different from stuff that i've written before and and does not have that um you know hero's journey arc and and um really uh trying to trying to do something different with narrative something a lot more hopeful but also like um you know just because something is hopeful or optimistic doesn't mean you can't have tension or a compelling narrative you know I think I'm also trying to think about other ways of telling story than just the written word, right? I mean, like, 
and, you know, obviously uh, there's, you know, theater and things like that. But I think as like, you know, when I was walking on the strike lines and stuff and I was, you know, th- everybody's conversation when you're walking is about AI and stuff. I'm really into the idea now of like very intimate stories, like one-on-one performance, you know, like that one person only experiences, you know, one at a time, or just like these, these ephemeral moments that you can't capture um, in other ways. I mean, that's part of what I'm doing here in Denmark is, uh, you know, is, is a hybrid storytelling, right? So I, uh, I already in my own practice mix uh, opera and comics uh, together. And so now I'm trying to do an investigation here on performance, comics, and new technology. And like, how do you tell those stories? And how do you come up with new ways to tell stories? And maybe that's part of the hopeful thing about stories is that we as a storytelling creatures are always looking for new ways to uh, to get our stories across. You know, I think a lot of times, Sheree, about our conversation about trees, you know, and how and how trees have stories to tell, you know, as well. And so how do we how do we sort of like get the bigger way of having these intimate stories that are huge and small at the same time? So I think that's where I'm kind of going. And I feel like um, but, you know, but also doing everything else that everyone else is talking about as well. We do have a little space. If anybody has questions, please uh, drop them in the chat for our group. Uh, In the meantime, I would like to ask folks if you have advice for writers out there trying to manage writing in this um, space uh, where we're dealing with so much um, world sturm and drang. Do you have any tricks for sort of, you know, focusing on your, yes, Nisi. I can tell you what I've been doing and what um, I've been doing for the last three years. And I have a novel coming out that I wrote entirely during lockdown with these techniques, um, which, by the way, is is a lot about uh, collectivism. OK, um, but so um, I meet with people for two for two two hour sessions every day via Zoom or um, we could use other platforms, but Zoom seems to be easy to use um, for for like five to 15 minutes. We talk about like awful things going on in the world or craft questions or whatever. And then for 45 minutes, we mute and we write. Um, mm. Or do writing related things like, you know, put together bios and headshots, or um, I think probably the most far removed thing was at one point, one of us took a bath, like, you know, turn off the camera, I'm going to go, I need a bath before I can write this passage. So yeah, but that, um, that seemed to have like the right balance of, um, being part of what is going on in the world and and acknowledging it and then going in and saying, but I'm going to do this other thing anyway. That's what, um, do it twice in one session and then twice in another. That's really interesting, Nisi, because the way I got conscience written was coming back, closing the door March 1st, because I knew the pandemic was coming, it was going to be bad. Um, and then going on to group writing and on, on zoom. And I could never have written that book in the short time that it needed to be delivered, (laughs) um, without body doubling, because again, I'm, I'm, uh, I've ADHD and all the disses, uh, and the body doubling was so crucial for my, for my sanity and my mental health to be able to, you know, get through and know, and we would stop and we would talk every 30 minutes, we'd stop and we'd have a break and we'd have five minute breaks. We'd check in with each other. What are you doing? How are you feeling? What's going on? And then you get back into it and you're just keeping, everyone's buoying each other up. It was so helpful. Yeah, it was, it was very uh, good to um, be supporting each other and validating each other. Yes, you wrote 10 more words than you wrote yesterday. Okay, cool. Exactly. Um, You know, oh, oh, you got rid of 10 more words. Great, great. You know, (laughs) 
Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and I used to always write alone, always, always. But um, this seems to be what I need now. Same, same. I actually don't know how I can go back to, to it otherwise, to, to being alone. Yeah. If anybody belongs to the Science Fiction Writers Association, they create spaces like that. Yes. Um, to write together. Yeah, Pardon the group that, I, you were saying. The group was is Cat Rambo's um, Discord. That's the one I had joined. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, for a lot of people, this might be true is that the pandemic made us even, I mean, I think writers are tend to be more isolated to begin with, right? And then the pandemic just made us more isolated. And I've, I've made a conscious effort to try to go out and see people in person. And, and just like talking with, with friends and especially writer friends, I find it's, it's often really energizing and sort of like, um, you know, when you, when you're alone for extended periods, working on your stuff that you could get like all like crazy in your head. And then you go out and you, you, you know, you talk to somebody and, um, you know, zoom is great. Uh, vir virtual meetings are great. Uh, but I, there's, there's my, my experience is nothing beats in person and, and there's, there's just like this real human energy about it. And it, yeah. I just find it very rejuvenating. Um, yeah, I've known a lot of people to start creating these spaces and sometimes they'll just go to coffee shops and write together and it creates an accountability and a companionability. Uh, my problem is I'll go to the coffee shop and want to talk. So um, mm -hmm. I may not be the best category uh, candidate uh, for this. Uh, I find myself as the timekeeper. I'm like, okay, 12 minutes after. We have a question from the audience. Hi from South Africa and thank you for a wonderful panel. A question to any panelists. How can we use science fiction writer? How can we as science fiction writers and filmmakers appeal to audiences on a more global level to inspire people outside of cultures and the countries we are used to? Awesome question. You know, I, I can't say that I've inspired people around the globe, so maybe I'm completely wrong about this, but something that I think is um, useful is finding the mythic bones in your work because myths and archetypes um, and even fairy tales are shared so globally these days that if you can find that you can create a mythic resonance in your work that's going to speak to people that are outside of your immediate community. Can you uh, just, I get, um, thinking of the audience, I get it, but mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about what kind of mythic bones or what you mean by mythic bones? Okay, so um, for me, like I have a background since I was a little kid in classical uh, Greco-Roman mythology, so um, that informs a lot of my work. But I will look at a story I'm writing and I'll go, well, what are the bones of this? What am I seeing? Um, uh, you know, uh, often I'm like, oh, this is the Persephone myth. There's a journey into the underworld and there's something like this. I remember from my book, uh, The Toymaker's Apprentice, which is a retelling of the um, original story of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. Um, I've got the, uh, you know, Drosselmeyer, Uncle Drosselmeyer, the, the uh, clockmaker, he's created these clockwork horses and they're riding down to the kingdom to see the princess who needs the magic nut, the Krakatuk. And I realized like, oh, mice have overrun this kingdom. So the fields would be laid waste because the mice are out of control. And um, and then there's this war that they passed because in the time period, there would have been a war with the Ottoman Empire and the Prussian Empire. And then I realized suddenly that, oh my God, they're the horsemen of the apocalypse. There is an entire biblical undercurrent here that I wasn't paying attention to. And that the story is, war, famine, pestilence, and death are the things that we are up against. And so finding that helps. Uh, my story, The Blossom and the Firefly, um, a, a character um, should have died, almost dies. And it's a Japanese story. It's set in World War II in Japan. And I start thinking about the river Styx because they're crossing water. And I do some research and realize that there are rivers in the underworld in Japanese folklore too. And so to be able to use that language for something that I knew from a different place, I think that resonates with readers because it's suddenly the unfamiliar becomes familiar. 
I just want to have a very quick anecdote. When when I was a kid, uh, a friend of mine was extremely into snakes, and he had some really large snakes, like like uh, Burmese pythons. And I hated snakes. I'm not into snakes. I don't like snakes. But when he was talking about snakes, and when he w- was all invested in his snakes, and telling me about this one and that one, and this is a corn snake, and this is an albino snake, and 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 the whole ecology of them, um, it was like holy cow, this is amazing. And and I think that that's the trick, I think, to engaging readers is you can talk about any subject, but if you're passionate about it, the readers will be too, even if it's not from their particular culture. As always happens when we talk to you all, we have run out of time. There is, there's too much good thinking here. Um, I'm deeply grateful to all of you, especially those of you coming from later time zones, such as Denmark uh, and the East Coast. Thank you so much um, for coming today. Thank you, Cody, for creating this space for us to have this conversation. And I hope that it will continue. Um, Look for further postings on Bookswell uh, that will carry the conversation further. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Everyone shared so many great resources. I'm going to do my best to go back through.